Uh, for everybody tuning in, welcome to Scale by Design. I am currently chatting with Michael Nogan. Uh, Michael, thank you for joining us today. I'm excited to have this convo with you. I'm very excited to have the conversation as well. Let's do it. Let's do it. So tell me about Overton uh, Venture Capital. Tell me about what you guys do. Yeah. Um, so I'm one of two general partners at Overton. Uh, we're an early stage um, investor. So we really focus super, super early. Um, usually there's some product market fit, but not always. Um, as a theme, we're generalist, but consumer has always been our North Star. So that could mean a company has a product that they're selling directly to the public, but it could also be a B2B to C. So maybe it's a service targeting, um, you know, S, like, uh, small and medium sized business employees. So cool. again, generalist fund, we invest very, very early. So pre series A, um, sometimes there's product market fit. Oftentimes there's some, there may not be revenue, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're super, super early. Yeah, that's exciting. And so how long have, uh, you all been around? Is this your first fund or, or how, how far into the, the company are you guys right now? Yeah. So in terms of the life cycle, we, we launched the fund, um, in the middle of 2019. Cool. So we had a, we were a rolling kind of a rolling close. So we started making investments out of fund one in 2019. We were about to gear up for what we call, you know, an investor road show in early 2020. If you recall what happened, there was something called this pandemic. Right. <laughs> um, so that, 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 that put the brakes on very quickly in terms of being able to travel. So we ended up having to pivot very quickly to a virtual close. Um, we all of, we ended up closing our fund one. So fund one, it's a little over 9 million, uh, AUM and we have, yeah, so we've been investing in since 2019. Um, we have about four or five probably new investments to make out of fund one before we start investing or raising and investing out of fund two. Okay. Yeah, that's uh that's really cool. And I I wanted to get your sense on, you know, when you're uh, right right now like what kind of companies like excite you the most? I know within like B2B to C or whatever it might be, like what do you see like the next, I don't know, generation of innovation look like for for the companies that you're looking like over the next year? What type of businesses are you really looking into? Yeah, so great question, especially since we're a generalist fund. So <laughs> what does that mean, right? It's very easy to say, well, we only do insurance tech. Um okay. But one of the big themes for us is what I call next gen commerce. So these are, you know, founders that are transforming this idea of commerce and meeting that customer or consumer wherever they are, which is kind of like this very amorphous um, uh, kind of catch all. But there are a few key themes within that next gen commerce that we're particularly excited and in, in investing in. Um, one is this, you know, idea of blockchain enablement. So, you know, we believe that there's this, you know, blockchain, this technology where, you know, all now, I mean, I guess the, the most common use has been around crypto, but we're not a crypto fund. But this idea that you can, you know, leverage the blockchain technology where it's open to do fractional ownership, um, you know, smarter contracts. You know, one of our portfolio companies actually enables, you know, if you have a digital asset, being able to take that digital asset offline, you know, you can only authenticate that because of blockchain. So, you know, that's certainly something that we're particularly interested in. Again, not on the crypto, but the actual mm -hmm. utility of blockchain. Um, another area of next gen commerce that's particularly interesting is what I call social commerce. Um, so this is, you know, if you, if you look outside of North America, the idea of live shopping, social commerce, huge in Asia, huge. But here in the US, it's still very nascent. So, you know, we look for companies that provide the tools to enable that social uh, commerce. And just to give you a sense of like just how big social shopping is in the US, right. um, this year um, in the US, I think about $45 billion will be transacted. And that should that's expected to double in two years. So it's growing very, very fast, but you know, much smaller than than last year. 
Um, cool. And that's just to be clear, like that's all like selling products directly through social media. Is that just like in terms of the definition of social commerce that we're using? Yeah, or, or using okay. to, to uh, shop with others. So for example, okay. one of our portfolio companies called Paloma that we invested in, it's this end-to-end -end platform that for brands that enable them to launch like within minutes, their own storefront so that way they're able to sell through instant, you know, Instagram Live or Facebook Messenger. So it's just huh. an, another way of being able to reach your customer in a social component. So again, you know, whether or not it's on your phone, whether or not you're you're in a in a live conversation with someone. So anyway, there's this rise in social commerce. That's cool. Um, and so like, how's that? Like, what's the difference? I mean, just like, I'm going to ask like some dumb questions because I'm not like as familiar, familiar with the area. So like, what would be the difference from like an ad that is driving somebody to the company website, like traditional advertising to like social commerce? Like, I, I don't know if I like, could you, could you explain it? Like the, the differences a little bit more just to make sure I understand fully. Yeah. So maybe on the marketing side, it might be someone clicks on an ad that takes them to a site, right? Mm -hmm. So more like an affiliate marketing channel, but you don't actually transact through that ad. It, you're transaction transacting on basically. A, a, you open up a different page or a different. Mm -hmm. It's a different experience. This allow this is enables you to transact immediately through i like instant message. Oh, okay. Um, cool. so it's actually pretty cool. So you can you know base any brand can create their own. Think you know what Shopify does for websites. Paloma is able to do through this, you know, you know, again, they're going after this, this theme of social commerce that people want to interact through live messaging between brands. It's, it, it's just more of a personalized experience. Okay. That's really um, cool. Yeah. And so this is like a, a fast growing space like that. You're like, you're seeing a lot of founders and venture capital uh, money kind of flowing into at this point, or. Uh, I've seen, well, I've certainly seen, you know, money being, you know, Forward into it, but what I'm saying is, I look as a as an investor, what's happening outside North America, and if you look at Asia, which a lot of the technologies seem to start there before they come here, social commerce is massive, and here it's still very nascent. So you know, part of my job is, to, especially early stage, not versus a growth investor like Series B, Series C, you know, closer to a potential exit. My job is to be able to look around the corner to say, okay, what's going to be the next thing within the next, you know, three to seven years, get in now. And then by the time, you know, year seven, year eight, hopefully that there'll be some sort of, you know, liquidity events, um, or, you know, obviously in, in layman's terms, an acquisition. So that is just a, a key thing that excites us as a fund that we're particularly bullish on. Um, That's really cool. Another, you know, key theme around um, next gen commerce is what we call more community driven. Um, so these are, you know, businesses or marketplace that are targeting or serving either communities that were previously underserved um, or demographic niches. So when we look at demography or if we look at community driven. So an example of that. Um, you know, one of our portfolio companies, <clears throat> and actually just for, for um, just if I think about just underserved communities, there's an interesting stat where I think, is it in 20, by the 2030, I think that there's no, I don't think that, yeah. So by 2030, there's not going to be any ethnic majority in the US. Hmm. So if I think about one of our companies, um, we typically prefer asset light models. This one's kind of an exception. It's called Young King Hair Care. Um, it's a, it's the first um, hair and body wash specifically formulated for black boys or boys with textured hair. And so, James, you know, you have a great do. I, I don't think that you necessarily walk down the multicultural hair aisle at Walgreens, but if you did. You would notice that there's a slew of product geared towards women, girls, maybe a little bit of men, but no boys. And so the kind of the retail nerd in me was like, okay, well, what's going on? And so we found this product 
Um, this is a company that uh, out of Atlanta, Georgia, that launched just two years ago that, you know, is basically 10 x the revenue. They're now in several hundred doors of Target, several hundred doors of Walmart, um, and they just did a licensing deal with um, for Wakanda. So oh. again, look atypical, then, you know, kind of, we, we like we like niche. And I guess the last piece I'll say about kind of demographics and so forth, because um, I know prior to the show, you'd mentioned, you know, you're kind of a stats nerd like 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 <laughs> me. And um, I don't know if you have you heard of that term, the silver tsunami? I actually haven't. I would love that sounds really interesting, though. What, what is it? So if you think about the a tsunami storm, this is called the silver tsunami. So essentially, you know, Every day in the U.S., again, just for context, every day in the U.S., um, one in five people turn 65. So, you know, we always talk about, you know, millennials or Gen Z, um, but we don't realize that people are living longer, um, they're staying at home longer. So as an investor, we get very excited about what are those products and services, you know, for them especially given these stats, it's like, okay, you know, one in five people in the U S are going to be over the age of 65. That's a lot of older right. people and they need stuff. Right. And so, um, one of our portfolio companies, actually one of our very first investments as a fund, uh, we found a company called joy Lux. Joy Lux is out of Seattle. Um, it is a, the, the, it's a device to treat female incontinence. So essentially it's a women's health business of products and services uh, geared towards women going through menopause. Again, not a sexy business, very important business because you know it's part of nature. But if you think about just this curve of people getting older, but there was really nothing around that just either it wasn't, just wasn't a very popular space. Today, it's certainly a lot more um, popular. People are talking about menopause like they haven't before because it used to be more of a taboo, just like a sexual, sexual wellness. So again, I, I, I mentioned next-gen commerce because it's a, it's a broad b blanket sure. for all these different things that we look at or, or different types of themes. Right. So yeah, you're looking, it's it's like what you said, you're kind of looking for underserved communities and, and pockets within a uh, commerce related field where you see an opportunity or like, wait a second, there really should be more of an emphasis here. There's there's more of a market to be served here. And so you, I mean, it's, it's like, that's the underlying theme, even though it could be a vast variety in terms of companies that you invest in. Uh, that you know may be completely different in terms of what uh, what kind of service or product they're providing, but the underlying theme is that it's like almost like a it's it's a it's a, a space or a solution that really hasn't been uh, thought of before or underserved. So I, I like that's a really interesting investment model and way to look at it um, versus <laughs> a lot of venture capitals that are like investing in like let's say if it's technology like investing in another like revenue tool that's like you know like there's oh, but, like five thousand of those right yeah so. and 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 i'm not saying you know this is just kind of one kind of piece in terms of how broad we are but how we think about you know where our investments like why should we invest in a particular sector or or, or a particular theme and so you know are there areas of opportunity points of friction in our in our everyday life you know, COVID, you know, accelerated a lot of the, the, the themes and trends that we had already pre previously identified when we were out there fundraising, trying to raise fund one, Overton Fund One, saying, okay, th there's going to be this gig economy. There is going to be, you know, this um, move, there, there's going to be a, an aging population. You know, here, these are just certain things that are like, okay, that's going to help. Um, us find proactively look and search for opportunities versus just okay well, we're going to drink out of the fire hose and you know you put your shingle on the door it says hey we're open we're a vc <laughs> you know all of a sudden that you know that spout turns on and you have all this inbound deal flow sure for, i've always found that the best investments are the ones that 
we proactively seek out hmm. or let other investors know, okay, this is where we add value. This is the areas that we know. This is where we believe to be opportunities. If you see these things or founders that are trying to build, um, please let us know. I like that. It's it's a lot more strategic. And I, I I just like the approach that has a heavy emphasis in, okay, this is a very high level step back, but what's the future that we believe in? All right. Like what, what do we think is, you know, what is, as you said, what, what's the world going to look like five, 10 years from now, which companies are going to be well positioned to thrive more importantly, even, you know, which founding teams are going to be uh, well positioned to thrive in the future that we believe in. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, but uh, that the, the linchpin is this evolving consumer. So right. like, okay, notice that everything I mentioned has to do with people. Um, People are the recipient, and you know if if you want to ask the question, okay, what do we look for in terms of making an investment? Because I kind of gave you areas that you know are you know where I believe there are opportunities to be and how we think about. Um, another big theme that I that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention would be you know future of work. So you know whether or not it's this great resignation. Um, you know if we think about uh, distributed teams. Um, you're shaking your head, so you probably understand. You know, I, I don't know, um, but you know, th this again, COVID accelerated, but this modern, you know, workplace. All right. Um, and then obviously, we think about as people get older, and and there's more uh, technology that we're using as part of our everyday life. Some of these old school jobs go away, right? That's kind of the, the pros and the cons of, of technology. So mm -hmm. what can you do to upskill or reskill? And so, you know, again, as a theme, future of work is also one of our big um, focus areas. And we've made, you know, quite a few investments in each of those kind of three I would love to hear more about that. And that's actually a topic I, I know a fair amount about just because my company uh, is an embedded recruiting firm. So we've worked with over 150 companies to help them hire. And I, I have another show called Town Acquisition Trends and Strategy. And I all I do is talk with VPs of town acquisition and chief people officers. And so we've really kind of, we've I've had a lot of conversations surrounding the future of work. So I'd be really curious to hear about uh, a couple of the, or even just like one of the companies you've invested in, in that space. And uh, like, even so more so it's like, okay, we've seen this acceleration of shift of where we are today. And we've, it's very clear the difference from where we were a couple of years ago to today. But in addition to getting a sense of like, what kind of investments you're looking for, I would love, like when it comes to future work, it'd be cool to know too. Um, what do you believe is going to happen seven years from now? Because I think that's also a really interesting question. The magic seven. Right. Yeah. yeah or 10. Like, yeah. Okay. I mean, just like, what, yeah, whatever, like, you know, crystal ball, right? That was a really long question. So one, just like what types of opportunities and companies have you invested in? And, and how do you see kind of future work evolving as a two-part question right there? Yeah. So as I mentioned, this, um, you know, rise this gig, gig economy and, and just rise of freelancers. Um, I, I remember going through, you know, college or post-college and, and my first job, and I was there for two years and a month before I launched my entrepreneurial endeavor. And, oh, you know, I remember having a conversation, conversation with my parents who were like, you know, you can't leave your job. You need to be there for, you know, a longer period of time. And now fast forward, I think about and just some of the resumes that I see for people who want to either intern at Overton, but people move around. I mean, two years seems like, you know, slow as molasses. That's like yeah. you know, eternity. So it'll be interesting to see how, you know, things continue to change. Maybe they revert. You know, I still believe that, you know, uh, higher education is going to change big time. Hmm. I'm a firm believer of, you know, listen, I have a daughter who's in third grade. I, I plan that, you know, she, once she, she's got to get past third grade, but let's say that she <laughs> graduates high school. I hope that she attends college, but, you know, she may not need to go to college. Maybe she decides to be, you know, whatever, but she takes, you know, 
it's almost like goes back to the whole like not that she would it's a vocational but like it's almost like what people used to do it's almost like two tracks do you need that higher education or do you mm -hmm. need to almost learn your skill it's it's yeah it's 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 really that's shifting a lot and even honestly over the past few years i've seen a massive shift like when i've been posting content on linkedin and i would you know five years ago i'd post like you know on the fact that i i personally didn't think a, a college degree was necessary for a lot of uh roles that uh we saw with our with our clients and uh, across like go to market and technical and and uh even a fair amount of gna roles uh uh, and it, it used to be somewhat controversial. And I, I think some, to some extent, people really didn't want to let go of the fact of like, Hey, I did this. I kind of paid my dues, or this is the path I took. And I think it was hard for some folks to kind of let go of the fact that there was a, a different way. Cause it maybe, maybe made them feel like, Hey, well, I put in this work to do this thing. And, you know, I, I, I the way that I look at it is there, there are no shortcuts, like whether you do go to, to school or not, like you, you find, you have to gain the experience one way or the other. And mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see the evolution of that. And then you're seeing more, uh, uh, educational resources online and courses that are, are specialized. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm part of a, a group called pavilion and it's, a, a essentially like a networking, uh, community based company, uh, primarily for revenue executives. I, I'm part of a CEO group, but they're primarily focused on like tech startups and they're, they're putting together courses like a CRO course, chief revenue officer, chief marketing officer, chief customer officer. So specifically, like if you're in tech and you want to be an executive, you can take a course and learn directly from- like a master class. Right. These are like, you know, a semester long course with actual coursework and assignments. And the, it's like highly specialized. So it's like, you know, you're talking about next gen commerce in a sense. There's also like, I, I think a similar kind of evolution in a sense with higher education where it's like, we're getting a lot more personalized and efficient uh, about tailoring yeah. that experience at, at a fraction of the cost as well, which is really, it's very interesting to me as well. Well, if you think about it, just from an a employee you know, perspective, and, and since you have the recruiting um, you know, business, there are millions of people that you know, have to stay competitive and stay, you know, not only competitive and employable, but that only happens when you're up to date on, you know, the latest technologies or not even so much the latest technologies, but just how can you use those technologies? Um, mm -hmm. And so do you get that from sitting in, you know, a, a, a college 101 class? Listen, I, I, I went to a liberal arts college. I majored in history and German. Oh, I love that. Do, do I use that? Do I use those skills? No, not necessarily, but I, I do believe that there is benefit to structured and critical thinking. I agree. Um, I do. But in terms of doing my job better, I definitely believe that we're going to start seeing a shift in, in uh, how we educate. But you, you had asked a question regarding, um, you know, one example of one of our portfolio companies going, you know, targeting gig workers. And one of them, um, this company it's called Wethos, uh, W E like ethos with a W and oh, cool. basically it's the first operating system that was built for independent creative freelancers. So it enables them to do their job. Um, they can run a virtual design and creative studio, um, by themselves. So they can scope mm -hmm. work, they can meet other, you know, potential team members to, to farm out work. Um, mm -hmm. They can get paid, they can split payments, but effectively it's a new way that ena uh, enables tools for this group of workers. And so, you know, that, that's just one example of how we think about, you know, tools versus, okay, that's kind of a nice, cool, neat, niche, niche, you know, business, but how scalable is this, right, as an investor? And something like this that can provide a real, like, now I can actually do my job. Right. Well, it's, it's a need to have, like, this isn't something where if it's a down market, people are going to cut, like it would be a core part of how they operate their, their business. Yeah. So I think that that's, and you know, what's really interesting is that we're seeing that in pretty much every industry, just technologies that are enabling folks to basically build a, a foundation and 
uh, you know, whether as a freelancer or a gig or like even just starting out an industry or starting a company, like one of some of the most interesting innovation that I'm seeing right now in a totally different area is actually in film. And there's new AI and uh, machine like uh, vision and all this type of stuff coming out right now that's actually enabling uh, like special effects on for for people like that, you know, don't have huge budgets. And so independent filmmakers can do all this really cool stuff that in the past cost, you know, several hundred thousands or millions of dollars to do. Now you, now you can make you can bring a, a, a film made on your iPhone to the big mm-hmm. screen, right? Yeah. I remember which there was. A, a film recently that was basically a full feature that was shot in, on an iPhone. But you're right. A lot of the technology has just come, you know, it, I guess it's part of this whole Murphy's law, but, you know, things are getting a lot less expensive. I mean, it's the yeah. same. I just remember- it's, it's, yeah. And it's just more innovative, like just some of the different tools, like in, and what AI is doing machine learning is doing and all of these different applications. Um, and this is just one of several examples, but and yeah, we're, I, by the way, we're yeah. not really talking. We're actually using like an open source AI, and uh-huh. we then and it's now creating this text for us because it uh, it knows yeah. the dialogue, that right? We want to have, which is actually very scary, but it is. I mean, all of it's like terrifying and exciting. Like I, you know, on this show, speaking on that topic, like I, there's a lot of buzz around biotech right now. And a lot mm-hmm. of the stuff that's happening with synthetic biology and uh, uh, engineering, it's just so crazy to see how everything is just seen as an engineering problem at this point in time. And like the human genome is like considered like the last like frontier when it comes to like engineering and fully understanding and, and being able to leverage that to help everything from climate tech to, uh, you know, personal health and pharma and everything, right? It's just, it's all now just an engineering problem to solve. And so it's it's going to be fascinating, but it's also terrifying when you think about the application and the potential, uh, and it's something that people are very worried about, obviously, like, what if we get this wrong? <laughs> uh, yes. it, yeah, it's the same with AI bad, and just different bad, applications. It's bad, bad sci-fi movie, but, you know, yeah. as an investor, while, you know, things like genome and, you know, all these like lab grown meats or, you know, using mushrooms to create a car, like what we're printing house, like all that stuff is really, really cool stuff. Um, but when you're an early stage investor like me and, and you have a fund that is on average, call it 10 years, give or take one or two years. My job as a, as a fund manager is to find companies, business models that within the first, I can identify them within the first kind of three years invest. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be some exit before year 10, right? And so that basically precludes me from investing in some of these, you know, crazy technologies that are right. so like, you know, early before, I mean, like pre-commercial. And so like, I think it's really fascinating stuff, but, you know, that's just to give you a sense of how, you know, one of the reasons why we as a fund we, we track it because it's interesting and maybe some of the applications, um, but it's not something that we would right. ever consider investing in. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 that makes a lot of sense. And I, I, what I also find interesting just about what your team, again, is just like getting back to like your vision of the future, because it sounds like you're coming in at a seed round maybe even sometimes like pre-revenue, right? So you're really just, ban- I mean, it sounds like you're primarily banking on the founding team the future that you mutually believe in. Um, and I, I, it correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, that's, that's kind of the underlying part of the underlying theme that I'm, I'm seeing. And then one thing that I want to slow down with you too, is getting into unit economics because I incredibly important, potentially harder to gauge very early stage. And I'm, I'm curious to see like when you're going through the diligence process, how far along do you expect your your portfolio uh, or potential portfolio uh, companies to to be along with defining unit economics is that something you do with them uh, or is that something you like how far along do you expect them to be when they're doing their pitch to you gotcha so there are kind of two questions there one is <laughs> yeah, I, I'm good like at identifying <laughs> identifying even when to invest right because you talked about like the founding team and and market and then there's that unit economics piece so let's just start with the first one which is how do we identify you know, when to invest, when to spend our time, 
right? Because if you think about it from a, a funnel perspective, there's lots of great, interesting deal flow, but it, our job is to say no 99.9% .9 of the time, right? So how do we, what's going to make us ter at least say, okay, there's enough interest here to, to move forward and go and really meet the, the team. But you're absolutely right. It's all about the founding team. But if we took a step back, the big question that we always ask ourselves, even before meeting the team is, okay, we see a deck, an investor presentation. We say, okay, here's the problem that they're trying to solve. And our first question is, you know, is this, is this a hair on fire problem? Like, how much friction is there in the market that is that people really, you know, give a crap, right? Because right. to get people, and again, this goes back to our consumer lens, because to get people to change their behavior, people say, oh, well, we're going to get people to change. It's like, it's very hard. <laughs> it takes a, <laughs> right. it, it's very, very hard. Um, so we always look about, okay, the big problem, it, how, is this hair on fire problem? And then is this solution? maybe not today, but their future vision statement of what they're trying to build, will they deliver a 10x value than what's currently available today by leveraging technology? Are they making it you know, easier? Are they going, you know, is this going to allow me to do my job better that I can't, that I wouldn't be able to do otherwise? And what I care if someone took it away. So, mm -hmm. you know, those are that's basically the two questions, both looking at the problem and then look thinking about the, the solve. If once we get to that, then we say, okay, yes, yes. Now, you know, early, early stage, how do you vet a business, right? Because there's not much history. Um, as as you mentioned, I, and I said up front that you know, sometimes we will have to make an investment decision pre-product market, like maybe they're in beta but yeah. there's zero revenue. So what we look for is we put a lot of stock in the jockey. We're, we're investing in the jockey, not the horse. So it's all about the team. You know, if this person or persons um, have the financial capital behind them, they can attract the right human capital. So the talent, you know, can they succeed? And then we as investors, and um, can we be hopeful? And so um, one thing I, I, I should say that's unique about Overton as a fund is that early stage, and part of the reason why my partner and I decided to launch Overton is that we wanted to create a fund where we can be more hands-on, so more value add. Um, part of it is you know, this innate interest in new things and, and being helpful, just as helpful people. And having been an entrepreneur, having been in, you know, st corporate strategy roles, former consultant. Um, but at the same time, it's how do we, you know, mitigate our investment risk? And so part of our, you know, secret sauce to Overton is that we're, unlike a lot of early stage investors, we have a bench of operating partners that we engage both in due diligence, but also want, after we make an investment, to help these companies get over certain hurdles. So if it's growth hacking or supply chain, these are experts who have been there, done that, that, you know, how can we, you know, we don't own the business. We're, we're, ven we're, we're VC, right? We're not private equity. So it's a different, you know, our job is to help the founder be there, a thought partner, um, Help, help them, you know, make critical decisions. But at the end of the day, they make the decisions. But what can right. we do to help them get to that next stage? If it's a series A, if it's about, you know, thinking it through their go-to-market strategy, um, thinking about different channel strategies, you know, should they try, you know, uh, I don't know, direct mail versus email marketing or, um, you know, a new retailer, whatever it is, right? So that um, is something that we gauge as part of our diligence to the founders. It's like, okay, are they amenable to working with, you know, helpful VCs? Because some, frankly, like there are some, you know, entrepreneurs who it's like, hey, I just want to check. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just you'll get your investor 
updates, but you know, leave or me not. alone. <laughs> Hopefully and you get updates. Fine. But the, right. and sometimes. Um so anyway, I just wanted to say, okay, that's kind of how we we bet. It's really getting to know founders and teams and where can we be helpful and, and valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that. But then you asked a question about you know scalability and unit economics. Right. So when you're super, super early and you're still like testing the market, maybe you're testing price and strategies, you know, you, you're certainly not thinking about profitability on day one, but how are you going to scale or thinking about scaling in a pro and with unit economics in your mind? So, you know, can you show early traction? that, you know, this, you know, over time that this channel becomes a profitable, like effectively, you know, at certain, at some point you are going to be cash flow positive. Mm. Right. And so we always think about and, and remind um, uh, entrepreneurs to think about and be thoughtful on their strategies towards, you know, making decisions that are going to be um, economically uh, sensical versus, well, you know, we're just going to, you know, grow at, at all expenses and we're going to raise another round because we know we're going to hit all these milestones. And so we've told our portfolio companies, especially starting in, I guess, earlier this year, because we could kind of see the writing on the wall with the public markets kind of slowing down you know, let's make sure that you have more than the, the tr traditional, you know, 12 to 16 months of runway. Does it make sense to either to slow the burn, but be more, you know, thoughtful on spend? Because, right. you know, right now it's about scaling, but scaling where you can, we don't know when that next check is going to come. That next raise is going to happen. Right. So. And so what's your outlook? Uh, specifically for the types of uh, companies that you look to invest in. I know your general is fun, but I'm um, just getting a feel for the type of investments you're looking into. What's what's your outlook right now? And what's your strategy? I mean, how much are you, are you kind of pivoting away from new deal flow and looking at your existing portfolio and, and putting more emphasis on them? Or what's your strategy going into 2023? Yeah, great, great question. Um, since I can't, it's two weeks from now. <laughs> yeah, it's coming up. I guess we need to know this stuff. Yeah, but I, it's yeah. hard to have a playbook when everything is so unpredictable. I guess I mean maybe it's coming a little more predictable. And you know, you know all I'm saying, you know, what I can say is that you know we're now starting to see valuations come down, um, which is a, a healthy thing because earlier this year, even in twenty uh, or twenty twenty one, there were a lot of larger funds. That were coming, you know, downstream, that or sorry, upstream, yeah, upstream, that were pushing, you know, these valuations, you know, to crazy heights. Um, now we're finally seeing things, you know, get calmer, um, where yeah. they should be more uh, and normalized. You know, investors like myself, we will have, you know, cash or, or dry powder, so we think that there's a tremendous opportunity in the new year. Because there I might have so. been deals where, you know what, the, the valuations didn't didn't make sense. There's great, you know, great business model, great team. Um, but, you know, there's certain you know, valuation type um, scenarios that we have to be able to, you know, achieve. And so maybe all of a sudden now we can achieve them. But I think that what excites us, number one, Every, anytime that there's a downturn pre presents a lot of opportunity. Oh yeah. Uh, number two, making sure that, that there's enough cash. And, you know, three, I'm telling all my portfolio companies just to make sure that they have, you know, runway because the fundraising environment, I think is going to be slow probably through the, until maybe the second half of 23, um, yeah. both for entrepreneurs, but also for fund managers that are raising such yeah, every everybody everybody's uh getting pitched, right? I mean, everybody's out there raising, and that's why I think a lot of like, you know, sometimes entrepreneurs I think forget that like when you know you're running a fund, you're running a business, and you're also con you know constantly in fundraising mode, and this is this is really impacting everybody's strategy across the board, whether you're 
you know, building a, uh, a your own company or your venture capital partners are, are kind of in a similar boat. So, uh, well, hey, look, we're we're coming up right to it. So uh, we we got to jump off in a minute here, uh, Michael. This has been a lot of fun. I lost track of time and forgot we were recording, which is always a good sign. Uh, just engage in the conversation and and learning from you. Uh, I uh, wanted to see if, if people want to engage with you and your company, like what, where, where should they find you online? Probably LinkedIn or Twitter. Okay. okay. And it's uh, Michael Nogan and last name. How do you spell your last name again? I just want to make sure N-O-G-E-N. people find you. N-O-G-E-N. Okay. N-O-G-E-N. Perfect. Um, well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate you joining me today. James, thank you. I had a great time. Absolutely. And for everybody tuning in, thank you for joining us. If you enjoy listening to Scale by Design, uh, we would love a, a review uh, either on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whatever streaming platform that you you tune in. And we appreciate you and we will talk to you next time. Take care.